Hey, we are live with the Dads Who Lead podcast. If you want your adult children living with you at home, click away from this video now. If not, you have teenagers in the home, stick around. We're going to be taking a deep dive at what the numbers are saying, what's causing it, and what we can do about it as dads. So in 2020, there was a huge spike in the amount of kids who are living at home with their parents who are in their 20s, between 18 and 29. There's an article that was released on September 4th from Pew Research looking at the U.S. 2020 census, and you can see this big spike from 2019 to 2020 from 47 to 52% of young people living at home with their parents. And again, this age range is 18 to 29 year olds. So this isn't just the college kids who are 18 to 22. This is reaching up into the late 20s. 26.6 million young people living at home with their parents. And what does this mean? What is it what is causing this? What does this mean for us as dads? What does it mean for our society? And how does this compare? How does this number to compare to previous generations? And this is really what's the big, what really catches my eye. Okay. So this is the greatest level since the Great Depression. Now, if you're listening um, on a podcast, this graph shows 1900 to 2020 in 10 year increments. In this first quarter from 1900 to 1930, you're looking at about 41 to 43%, peaking in 1940 at 48% of kids, 18 to 29, adults, 18 to 29, living at home with their parents. So what does this say? In this era, maybe looking back, if your family was a blacksmith, if your family was a plumber, if your family worked on the farm, you very often did whatever your family was doing. You are part of that family business. So if you're 20, 25, 30 years old, very frequently you helped out on the farm. You helped out in the shop. That's what you learned to do as a kid. That's what you grew up. That's how you're able to add value. We really started dropping into significantly greater ability to transport, to be able to move easily with automobile evolution of an advent of automobiles, telephone, all of these things in the 20th century allowed the world to get smaller and for us to be able to travel and pursue our own desires and careers more easily. So our number dropped 1960, we're at 29% and it held in that like 29 to 32% from 1960 to 1980. And then we start to see this rise, 4% rise from 1980 to 1980. 90 up to 36 percent but now as we accelerate and we move from 1990 to 2020 goes from 36 to 47 percent now this kick to 52 percent in july of 2020 where it's over half that is largely because of the pandemic that's largely because there were more kids living at home with their parents uh, because colleges may have been shut down now the numbers, if we look at this next article, drop down only 2%. So now we are at half, find exactly, in July of 2022, half of adults 18 to 22 are living with one or both of their parents. There's another very interesting thing about this article we're going to take a dive into. But if we look at this, this sharp incline, and it's going up faster now, it's starting to get exponential. You can see this curve. And probably in third 2030, it's going to be, who knows, up here in the 60s. So what is causing this? What, why do we have so many young people that are at home with their parents? What is the skill that, are miss that is missing? And I'm going to talk about what I believe that is shortly. But first, the narrative is shift from, is this good or bad? Okay, this is the title of this article. Americans more like to say it's a bad thing than a good thing. More adults, young adults living with their parents. Now, that's up to you to decide if you think it's good or bad that there are 25-year-olds that are still living with their parents and unable to either unable or unwilling to spread their wings and take risks and get out into the real world, contributing and 
having the independent skills to take care of themselves versus sticking at home, playing it safe, saving up, being comfortable, whatever it is, that's up for you to decide whether you think that's good or bad. But the real kicker is the conversation that's been created. Now it's not about what's causing it. It's about how do people feel about it? The emphasis is no longer on the problem or what's causing the problem or what's causing this increase or how this increase can affect our society at whole. How is it going to affect the next generation? If we've got kids that are young adults that are still at home, not developing and growing and you know, raising the next kid, if they're not able to model how to live on their own, how is that going to affect the next generation of those 18 and 29 year olds that have kids? How's it affecting that younger generation? All these bigger questions that are underlying has been covered up by how do people feel about it? Now it's about feelings. It's not about action. As men, as the masculine energy within our home, within our community, we are about action. We're about moving the ball down the field. Now, do feelings matter? 100%. People will not always remember what, they, what you do, but they'll always remember how you make them feel. Now, how we get that, those results matter, but the results themselves also matter. Results matter tremendously. So if we're, we take a look back here, if you're listening, this, there's this huge spike and there's been a substantial increase over the past decade and it seems like it's trending even more i was a school teacher for seven years taught middle school high school coached high school wrestling and football and during that time i saw a huge shift in the way that we teach kids and the way that we hold expectations okay and the way that we teach around safety and security and this has a direct link to independence. In schools, it's the messaging has continued to be, especially, especially since the pandemic, stay safe. Don't run in the halls. Don't say anything that could offend anybody. And as a teacher, I have to teach to the most sensitive student. Whatever the most sensitive teach student's level is, that's who I teach to. So if there's something that I could say that would be offensive to a student, even if there's one kid in the class, I need to consider that kid and how it affects their experience, their educational experience. Now, there are strengths and weaknesses to that. That's part of the reason I left was that I felt that this environment was becoming sterilized. We weren't preparing kids for the game of life. We were preparing kids for the next level, the next grade. And next grade is not preparing them for life, clearly. The school system initially is designed for kids to move through graduate, and then have a skill set that allows them to drop into the workforce and be effective. So we're looking at 37% college graduate and 90% high school graduate in 2020, 37.5%. So a huge percentage of people are graduating college. So schools are not preparing kids for the workforce. We're preparing kids for the next level. We're not preparing them to get punched in the mouth which happens in the game of life. Um, when my dad was in eight, maybe eight years old, he and his brother, who was five, he tells me stories about them riding around their neighborhood on their bikes, independent, away without any parents. This was very, very common. Granted, this was in the 60s. So as a result, he develops these independent skills, being out on his own in the world, decision-making, looking for hazards, knowing intuitively what he can do, what he's not able to do. And he's not going out into the world with deer in the headlights because he's got skills since he was eight years old being out doing that. When my son was going from fifth grade to sixth grade, we spent about three, four hours riding around the town on our bikes, teaching him signaling, teaching him routes to get to school, teaching him what to look out for as he was riding his bike so he could have that independence and that opportunity to ride the four miles from our house to school on his own on his first day of sixth grade.
which he was able to do. Now, he's probably ahead of most sixth graders. Most sixth graders aren't probably riding on four-mile rides by themselves at 11 years old across town at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, with that said, let's just say that was probably something my dad would have done easily when he was like nine, right? So he was he was maybe even when he was eight. So he's a little further behind where my dad was at that age. What I've seen from being a teacher is that kids' independence levels, there's more expectations that like there's they're hand delivered into the school. The school environment is very structured, sterilized. These are this is what you can say, this is what you can't say. This is what you do. This is what you can't do. This is exactly what's expected. And in life, in the business world, and applying for jobs and looking for girlfriend, it's not like that at all. There is not a set of rules that's defined. The better you can find the unwritten rules to most optimize for yourself and most understand yourself to be successful, the better success you're going to have. So as a result, if we're moving kids from the home, which is regulated to a school bus, to the school and back and through this cycle, and we're regulating college campuses more and more, they're not going to have that experience of what's it like in the real business world. What's it like to have, when I mean, we're having kids that are graduating from college that have never had a job before, and then they expect to be able to go out and work. You've got to have both. You've got to have the ability to understand the knowledge and you've got to be able to go out and do the work. Now, I'm not saying that the skills that are learned in school aren't important. There are benefits to knowing math and science and reading and writing, yes. And it's important for us kids to also have a clear idea of what it means to put in a day as a work, what it means to balance a checkbook, what it means to get punched in the mouth and be able to deal with it, how to deal with adversity, understanding the confidence in yourself that when something doesn't go wrong, you don't go hide on a screen or in a bottle, but there are things that you've got to do to go, get after it and get yourself going in the right direction. So that is one cause that I see is the education system is getting softer. In that seven years, there is a drastic change in the way that we held standards for kids uh, and the way that we candidly coddled kids within the classroom and created an environment that was very focused on the kid as opposed to focused on preparing him or her to kick ass in the game of life and be able to deal with things that are coming their way. Having some experience in the business world, coming from education, there is such a stark reality that kids get hit with when they come out because they think that things should be fair and equal. And the reality is everybody has advantages and disadvantages and the people who are most successful are able to leverage their advantages to the maximum. Media is the second thing. There's a huge increase in the fear factor within the communities. So if you're just watching the news about what are the concerns, there's a, su a suppression of natural exploration. And there's a, a expectation within the news to push the default into fear. Fear is a power, very powerful motive. And that's what I see a lot of our modern media dropping in to set people's mindset. I've even seen it with people within my own family where they see fear messages and then their mindset, you know, the, something that's happening even across the world, across the country, across the state. And when they see, hear about an opportunity or they see my three-year-old daughter climbing a chair, they're like, oh, wait, she could fall. That's fine. With me, that's fine for my kid to fall four feet on the ground and hit her butt. Okay. What did you learn? Oh, I was climbing this chair and it tipped over weird. Clearly that's something I need to make an adjustment with as opposed to climbing, like don't climb anything. Now you're not developing balance. You're not developing that, that, you know, you just heard, you just, you just get told to be careful and stay safe. You're never going to take risk. It disrupts one's relationship with risk when we don't 
allow them to drop in to dangerous situations carefully. We absolutely need to make sure that our environment is one that, yes, is safe against death and serious injury, but there's a big difference between knowing how to navigate and getting the training on how to navigate dangerous situations carefully, like riding a bike or mountain climbing or whatever it is, playing football and avoiding it completely. And now it's even with this, the pandemic, it was just stay in your house. That's the safest thing. And there were a lot of people that now their default is still, it's safest if I just stay in my box and I don't branch my mind, branch my body. Let's just trust everyone else. And if that works for you, great. For me, for my family, we want to expand and grow. And we're not able to do that inside a box. We've got to expand. I don't want to get too far into this last point, but another big part of the cause of being inside more and a suppression of the independence that's being developed within our young people, we've got to understand that there are levels, right? So I feel, I mentioned my dad and my son, and they, my dad was a few years ahead of my son. I see it as, on average, kids are about four or five years behind on independent skills. And what, do, what does it mean? What does that mean, independent skills? I mean, being able to get across town on your own. If you can't get across town on your own, how are you going to raise a household on your own? Are you able to apply for a job, go across town on your own? Are you able to go to the grocery store and know what you need to get for food? Are you able to plan out a trip? Are you able to decide to, to uh, what jobs apply to? All of these little things that happen that used to be happening in high school for kids as far as applying for jobs, it's, it's just, it's getting kicked down slowly. It used to happen 13, 14 years old, people are getting their first jobs. Now it's like 17, 18, sometimes even 20. Hey, you're 20 years old, time to get a job. It's getting kicked down further. The sooner we can start, understand this if you're a dad, the sooner you can start fostering skills of independence, the more powerful of an experience and the more powerful of an individual a per, your child will be because they'll have the tools. It's not my, di my daughter, my son is 21 years old and it's time to get a job. At that point, it's too late. If your kid is 14, there are skills that he can develop. It takes years. It takes years to develop. Working for somebody with landscaping, maybe they'd never hire you back. Okay. Over time, you see like, I must have done something wrong. Oh, I wasn't following directions closely. I wasn't showing up on time. Whatever it is, learn these lessons early because the marketplace will give the kids the hard lessons. The school is setting up a test so that you can pass the marketplace, being out in the field that allows you, you know, there's a test and you learn with it all in one day. Here's your challenge. Learn. Let's go. Oh, you pass the test. You get paid. There are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. It's huge as dads that we recognize this shift in independence. And that it happens really young. Like even if your child is a couple years old, you can start taking action. Like, hey, you can go, you can put your socks on, your shoes on by yourself. You can go to the refrigerator and get your own food. You can wipe yourself, whatever it is. That's, it's really easy for us to drop into this. Like, hey, I want to be the hero. I want to help my kid. But often we can do the most to help them is have them do that themselves so they can develop the basic skills. Okay. You're tying your shoe by yourself. Now you can tie your shoe. You can get your coat on by yourself and you can get out the front door and close the door and lock the door and go down the street and come back within an hour. And now within two hours, within four hours, and now you're able to go out for a whole day on your own. There's a lot of skills that we can develop. Now, why aren't we getting out as much? Why aren't we, you know, why is it that my, that was probably a, a totally regular thing for my dad in the 19, 50s to be out riding his bike. We are now, I'm going to show you an article, the amount of screen time, the amount of screen time that kids are on in society globally, just under seven hours in the U S just over seven hours and Gen Z. So like my teenage son is Gen Z nine hours is the average. Now understand 
this is the average, which means there are kids that are doing like two that are going to significantly bring down the average. That means there are other kids that are doing 11, 13. This is just the average. So if you're, a, if you're one of the kids that doesn't use it as much, like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm out playing sports. I'm doing a lot of things away from technology. Uh, maybe they don't have as much of a technology focused school. School is now spending more time. So that's part of it. Now, all of a sudden, this nine hours could be 12, 13. So if you're awake for, let's just say, 16 hours a day, there are kids. So it might even be less than that. That's more than half of their waking hours that they spend plugged in. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to be a hero on this than it is out here. So their internal power is getting expressed into the phone, into the characters, into their social media account, into their avatar, into their friends, into their likes, as opposed to creating themselves. And learning. Now, I'm not saying there aren't things in technology where people can go in and learn and become tremendously powerful. That, but what I am saying is, the vast majority of the time, especially like when I was a kid, it was about video games, and it, or it was about technology as recreation more than education. And if I drop in to the phone world, it's really easy to get sucked into that dopamine hit. And it's way less work than it is to go out and really do the work yourself. It's way less work to be on the phone and level yourself up and get your character stronger or meet new people, whatever it is that's going on, than it is to, to hop on your bike and ride across town and hang out with your friend in person or get underneath the squat rack and get strong so you can go out and crush someone in a football game, whatever it might be. The technology way is the easier way out. And then what's get the question that we have to ask as dads is what's getting missed because of the increase in technology? What lessons did we learn as kids and our dads learn as kids and our grandmothers learn as kids that we aren't getting because now they're on technology and technology has taught us a lot and it's accelerated a lot of knowledge, but the skill set is what really matters. All right, so what are the action steps? What can we do as dads to take action and help our kids develop this independence from the jump? And I'm not just talking about when they're 16, but even when they're younger, when they're two, three years old, how can we start to help develop that independence so that they've got an edge dropping into the game of life? There are three things we're gonna talk, talk about before the end of this video. The first one, very few dads do this, is modeling true independence and independence. I don't mean as taking care of your own household, but I mean, for you, what do you like to do for yourself as the leader of the home? How are you penetrating the world? What are you doing? Is it lifting weights in the morning? Is it going hunting? Is it going fishing? You know, I enjoy jujitsu, rock climbing, whatever you like to do and enjoy life. If you can go out and do that away from the family or invite your kids to come with you, that modeling of independence shows them, hey, I'm doing more than just going to work. I'm also doing this extra thing. And those extra things are where all the mileage comes. So where it, all the traffic jams clear up. Roger Staubach had a quote, said there's never a traffic jam on that extra mile. And you think about the kids who are playing soccer, football, drama, whatever activity they're doing, that's what's going to take them to the next level. Because the teach the school is like basic. It's like life support. It's like the minimum amount out that you need just to survive. If you really want to thrive, you need to do the extra things. Are your kids doing the extra things? Are they not just doing their assignments, but finishing it thoroughly? Are they getting out, doing extra activities, exploring, expanding their skills from start from dawn to dusk, that's the key, is modeling that for them. They need to see, not just here, like, hey, why aren't you doing sports? Hey, why aren't you doing your homework? But they need to see that you are taking that action, that we as dads are taking that action. Second thing, this is tough, right? This is taking full ownership that 
there is no one else in this world that is going to care more about the growth of your kids than you. And when I mean growth, I don't just mean them being comfortable in home and having a nice environment and feeling loved. I'm talking about them being in positions that are uncomfortable that allow them to take the next step to branch out outside. Now, I'm not saying that moms don't want this for their children. What I am saying is inherently for us as men, for thousands and thousands of generations, we were the ones that were taking our kids out in the woods and teaching them how to hunt and scavenge for food and being out in the world and taking life as an adventure. My mom growing up helped me feel comfortable, helped me feel fed, nourished, and loved. My dad helped me feel uncomfortable. And as a dad inherently, are you going to take the full ownership in knowing that there's no one that sees the importance of your kids being able to deal with being uncomfortable as much as you? If we look into the world, who are the ones out doing the most uncomfortable jobs? And then maybe this is you listening. Are you out on top of a high wire fixing an electrical box? Are you picking up trash? Are you underneath a sink cleaning like underneath the houses, doing the dirty work, doing the work that's hard, that's early, that's late, the work that no one else is willing to do? Are you willing to do it and have that be the extra effort that pushes you over the edge and creates that success. Now, are there certain ways that you can leverage success in a way that is more tactical? Absolutely. That's a huge level. But before you can even reach that, you've got to have the work ethic to be able to drive. And that ethic is taught. Yes, it's taught by moms. Moms can absolutely play a role and show their kids ethic. But as the leader of the home, We've got to know that inherently, like in our hind brains, thousands of generations, the dads have been the ones taking the kids out. They're looking to us to know that it's okay to have cold, uncomfortable fingers out in the snow, hiking through, looking for an elk or whatever it is that you do. It doesn't have to be hunting. It doesn't have to be outside, but something that puts you in a space of physical and mental discomfort, and they're looking for you as a model. If you're taking that action, if you're taking the ownership that it's your responsibility as a dad to make sure that your kids are comfortable being uncomfortable, that's where the independence comes. You're scared. I feel scared to go outside because it's dark. And I'm going to do it anyway. That's confidence. That's the kids with confidence. Can you take ownership, making sure that you're, well, I've heard a lot of dads, well, it just kind of is the way they are. Is it, or is there more that we can do? Is there more that we can do? The last one has to do with risk and it's tied into number two. Can we create a positive environment for risk-taking? Schools, as I mentioned earlier in this episode, restrict risk. Schools, cause doubt around risk-taking. Schools discourage risks. They want us to stay in a box. They want us to be in the status quo. They want us to do the assignment, not say anything that's going to hurt anybody's feelings, not do anything that's going to cause potential injury for yourself or anybody else. Just like their life is easier when risks aren't taken. The reality is the more risks we take in a game of life, the higher chance we have of success, the higher chance we have of getting the job that we want, the higher chance we have of getting the girl that we want, the higher chance we have of having a life of adventure that makes impact. Every time you choose to step out of your comfort zone, you're growing as a man and your kids need to start to learn that process, that if they stay in the box, they will stay in the box. And 90% of us will stay in the box. There are still myself personally, daily places where I'm still in the box. And there may, there almost certainly are ways that I'm staying in the box that I don't even see yet. But creating a clear vision, 
modeling what it looks like to live outside the box, as well as creating that environment for them to know, hey, my daughter's climbing up the counter and my, my dad or mom's over, oh dear, she's climbing the counter. Let her climb. If she falls, she falls. She's learning how to take risks. It's not my job to keep her safe all the time from now. If it's, if she's climbing up a 20 foot ladder, yes, I'm going to stop her, right? There's the risk of death. But if it's a small situation, like, yes, like, like really knowing and they're, cause your kids get better at skills, they're going to be able to take more and more risks. So for someone who's never been camping before going car camping, pitching a tent, and sleeping out in the woods in June on you know a nice like 60, 70 degree night, that's challenging. Now you've done that three times. Okay, now let's go backpacking. Let's hike in three miles, set up camp, climb to the top of a mountain, set up camp. Now you've done that a couple of times. Okay, now let's go on a, a continuous four-day backpacking trip. That's 50 miles. Now your entire perspective, because of all of these things that we have experienced, we're creating, as you develop skills, as you create experiences with your family, now we've gone from car camping to a 50-mile hike. Their entire perspective of what is safe, what is adventurous, has completely transformed from, wow, we went camping, we slept in a tent next to our car, to we hiked 50 miles into the woods across a river through, we saw bears, we saw, you know, we, we heard sounds at night, we, you know, all those things. Now it's becoming conditioned. It's becoming conditioned within their soul, within their heart, within their mind, within their confidence that they can go and do hard things and they can work through that. So that after they've, they've done a wrestling match or they've gone and done a hard 50 mile hike, or they've done a gymnastics tournament, or they've run 13 miles, whatever it is, whatever you're the dad, you decide, you create the reality for your kids that you want. After you've done that and created that reality, how is it going to feel when they have to go and talk to a girl or a guy or a friend they need to have a hard conversation with after they've done this hard shit? It's not going to be, it's going to be like, oh, this is not a big deal. And their friends are going to say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go tonight. I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough shape to go on the hike or do the ABC and you're like, this is not a big deal. And when you're in that space, it's not a big deal. You're powerful. You're powerful. Your kids are powerful. So this environment that we create positive risk-taking can dramatically transform. Don't wait until your kid's 16. Start taking action today. Small habits can stack up daily thing, daily ways that we interact. I catch myself every day. Like, Man, I'll, I'll say to my three-year-old, oh, be careful. Oh, okay. I need to make sure that if, it, does she, do I really need to say that or can she explore? Can she run across a, a wet puddle and slip and fall and have that be okay? I don't want her re running through her entire life thinking, be careful, be careful, be careful. I want her thinking, okay, where's success? Where's success? There's two ways that we can look into the world. Are we looking into the world like, what are the opportunities? Where can I take action? Where's the success? How can I make this work? Or are we looking at, where are the dangers? What do I need to do wrong? Now, inherently as humans to survive, we had to look for dangers. But now there's no saber tooth tiger coming through my garage door. I need to start thinking about how can I be the best and to be on top for my son and two daughters to be on top, their mindset needs to be, where's the success? And what risks and what skills do I need to develop to get there? You've enjoyed this episode. Please leave a positive review. It will greatly help the channel. Head over to dadswholead.com, download our free leadership guide. It is a five-day transformational process that will really elevate your connection and leadership skills. It is 100% free for a limited time. It will be a book in 2023 that will be published, likely will be expanded. So while it's free and available, pick it up now. Please send me a message if you're a dad and you just want to have a conversation. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to serve. I want to help as many dads as I can in 2022 and beyond. 
Have a blessed night, morning, wherever you may be. Stay hungry, stay happy, and we'll see you in the next episode.